that, I'd be glad to move this year. Point out that Virginia is one of the most defense heavy states in the Union, right up at the very top. And if you want to look at like the percentage of money being spent on defense in Virginia, we're really right at the top. And we have some of the biggest defense contractors here in the life. And not only is there sequestration as a problem here, but there are some other threats. We want to talk about them. One of the threats, of course, is simply that we are diminishing the number of active duty people. We now have 20 to 25,000 fewer active duty people than we have when I, when I came to the region. And these are people who buy houses, automobiles, they do all the kinds of things that really make the economy run. On top of that, the people who the federal government employs earn income that is substantially higher than the national average. Um, the typical federal employee's salary a year ago was about $90,000. You add on fringe benefits and you're up to roughly 120. Now compare that to the national average salary, which is in the 50s, and the, and the regional average here, which is in the 40s. So federal employees are kind of fiscal gold. You may not like the federal government, but when those people are hired, they earn higher than usual salaries. Whatever. Wonderful. <laughs> this is another way to look at defense spending. You can see that defense spending has been basically constant over the last sort of decade. This were the boom boom times when defense spending was growing at real rates of five or six percent a year. Well, that's long gone. And uh, that's why our economy is sort of wallowing around. Now this graph is maybe a little bit deceptive in that it says that now defense spending accounts for only 36.7% of our regional economic activity. So we are more diversified now than we used to be. The problem is, the reason for that is not because our private sector has grown, but rather because defense spending has basically been constantly in declining a little bit. So we've become diversified, but really not for the reason we would like. I mentioned this defense spending by state. These are total defense spending dollars, and Virginia leads the pack very well up in the $50 billion a year range. These are percentages of the state product. We're actually second among the states and third if you count DC. And I stuck in Wyoming there because it has the lowest percentage nationally. That uh, thing to relate to federal government spending. I mentioned active duty personnel. We have almost a quarter of a million in Virginia. These are just a little bit out of date. And uh, you can see where some of the other big ones are. This will be tough to see, and I apologize for it, but the size of the circles relate to the amount of defense spending. This is Northern Virginia, and this is Hampton Roads. You can see their circles are larger than ours. It means they're spending more money on defense there than we are. Now, proportionately, we're larger in our dependence upon defense spending, but they're spending more total. They're even more responsible or responsive than to the declines than we are. Who are the biggest defense contractor in the region, Maryland and Virginia? Of course, Huntington Ingalls, that's no secret. One of the things that's out there, though, is President Trump has talked about building two carriers at the same time. If that occurs, that would be a major engine for job creation and economic activity, because that would last quite a long time. Now, I told you these numbers before. Average salary of a federal employee, 90,000. Virginia, average 53, Hampton Roads, 46. So these are people who, when they disappear, it makes a difference. People just don't sell as much. Retail sales can affect them almost immediately. I was just beginning to talk about some other threats to defense spending, a change in focus. To the extent that we focus on the Chinese and the Koreans, we might lose 
an aircraft carrier task force to the Pacific, to San Diego or to Hawaii. Each carrier task force is worth roughly about a billion dollars a year to the region. Um, I want to mention number three, airplanes, ships, things like that have become much more expensive than they used to be. With defense budgets pretty well capped, if you pay more for the carrier or for the F-35 or for a submarine, you don't have as much money left for people or for keeping up those assets. And so that's a, another threat to what's going on. As are rising personnel costs. Now, I'm not here to argue that the people don't deserve these things. I'm simply saying when you spend money on that, you can't spend it on something else. And that, too, might mean that we will see fewer people at Oceana or fewer planes or something because of those. And finally, after hand number five, at some point if this continues, the United States Navy is going to decide that it's too expensive to be at Naval Station Norfolk. But not just the United States Navy, it might be Norfolk Southern, it might be Huntington Ingalls. There are all kinds of people who have to figure out how to deal with this stuff and it becomes more and more important. I also want to mention our use of our naval assets. We're overusing them. And I think we see some evidence of that in terms of performance and the like, but uh, We've been deploying them just about as often, but we don't have as many ships, as many hulls, and so uh, we're wearing the stuff out. And we can't repair the stuff, we can't maintain it as, mu as much or as well because of sequestration. So the bottom line is, <coughs> the Lord giveth, but the Lord can take away, and the last decade or so, the Lord could take away. The previous decade, the Lord was giving, and we had lots of economic growth. But we are really still very sensitive to federal spending and particularly to defense spending. <coughs> Talk a little bit about the port. And I want to show you just really one particular slide here. This is a slide for TEUs, the 20-foot equivalent units, the boxes you see on the trucks. Uh, you can see we set another record <coughs> this year, uh, last year. Uh, the numbers just came out for this year. We're up another 7% in 2017. However, I do have to point out that Savannah and New York, New Jersey went up more than 7%. They did a little bit better than we did. So we marginally just lost a little bit of market share, probably, uh, in terms of uh, where we stand. But we've had a real turnabout in terms of the efficiency of operation of the port in dealing with congestion and the like, but we there face some challenges too. I mentioned congestion. And you've gone out Route 164 from Portsmouth to Suffolk. You've oftentimes seen that lineup of railroad cars and trucks there. You have to find ways to handle that. The depth issue, there are now ships afloat that carry 20,000 plus TEUs. They require deep draft. We have to make sure that we can handle them because our competitors are going to be able to do so. And finally, I want to mention this, that uh, in October of 2018, there's another labor contract coming out. Now, the Hampton Road Shipping Alliance relationship with the ILA, the Longshoremen, has generally been pretty good. but. Uh, that's coming up, and uh, we need to keep our eyes on that because we don't want our port to be shut down. Let's talk a little about hotels and tourism, which of course uh, impacts Virginia Beach. <coughs> These numbers are all good. Hotel revenue and rep for revenue per available room, which is sort of a coin of the realm in the house of the hotel industry, they're all up. Uh, USA, Virginia, Hampton Roads. But some areas are doing better than others. The beach is doing very well. <clears throat> Williamsburg, not so much. The historic Triangle, I've talked about this before. They've kind of a marketing problem. Uh, I have grandsons, and they're not particularly interested in going there, even though we want them to go there. They'll go to Bush Gardens, <laughs> but not so much the historical things. And uh, 
lawyer has to find a way to, to deal with that. But here's a caution, a cautionary slide. Look at that right hand column. That is hotel revenue as a percent of our GRP, our gross regional product. And you can see that that's gradually been falling. The hotel, motel industry per se then is not as important now economically as it used to be. And this is despite the fact that the people in Richmond every year hand out sort of uh, Kool-Aid kinds of numbers that say it's all going up. Well, it's not. Here, now, that doesn't include all the other kinds of spending that tourists do, and notably, it doesn't include Airbnb. This is the percentage of Airbnb revenue in Hampton Roads. It's a percentage of what the hotels are bringing in. So it's sort of like 1 in 25 now. But this is only what we can track through Airbnb. And of course, there are people other than Airbnb doing this stuff as well, as you know. Uh, the interesting thing here is that especially in Virginia Beach, along the ocean front, it is the big places, the four plus bedroom things that are bringing in the most revenue. We did a study for the city of Virginia Beach uh, on the impact of Airbnb and had these conversations in which we said, look, we know some people out in the neighborhoods are vexed about the house next to them being rented, but that's sort of small potatoes compared to these big guys. That's where all the revenue is, and that's where you need to focus your regulatory <coughs> and enforcement efforts. Because if I have a house, I can put it on the market, I can take it off the market. It's really tough to track me down. But those people who have four, 10, 12 bedrooms, you can track them pretty easily. And uh, that's where all the revenue is if you want to collect taxes or if you begin to have behavior problems and so forth. So that's sort of a complex thing, but uh, I think the councilmen know about the report we did. But if you want a copy of that, we can supply it to you. Let's talk a little bit about the housing market. It's been recovering, but not booming. I think that's the best summary. You can see we had some notable price decreases. But our increases have been pretty modest and are well below the national average. We are selling more homes than before. In fact, I just read that we're up now in the 25,000 range for 2017. And the number of days on market, that's the red, that's gone down. So the housing market's doing better. But the big question out there is how much distressed inventory is still being held by financial firms? Now, we did a presentation the other night to uh, the savings and loan people, the credit union people, and they said they really weren't holding much distressed inventory. And by distressed, I mean somebody who has a house that's now underwater and so they have to sell it, or a bank owned property that they had to take over. Well, sometimes these properties aren't in very good shape. And they know that if they put these properties on the market, they're going to drive down prices. Well, short sales as a percentage has really declined from the peak. And REO sales, the bank-owned properties, aren't nearly as many of those coming on the market. So all of this is good. And the reason <clears throat> we need to pay attention is, if it's a bank-owned property, it sells on average for only 52% of a regular property. And if it's a short sale, 69%. So when those properties come on the market, they push down sales. So critical to the recovery of the housing market in the region is knowledge of how many of these properties are still out there. And the answer is we don't know. And nobody's going to tell us. But it looks like things are improving. And I stuck this one in. This is sort of my quiz for the morning. Who's the guy in the beard? Paul Krugman. Yeah. Paul Krugman, you're right. <laughs> Paul Krugman, uh, who has written a little bit about the next topic I'm going to talk about, which is declining labor force participation rates. Yeah. yeah. 
If you are age, let's say, 25 to 64, prime working age, are you in the labor market or not? Are, are you either employed or looking for a job? Well, the answer for men that dream <coughs> is that that's been falling for years and years and years. Women, that surprisingly has gone up dramatically, but even in, for women it's begun to tail off. And so the blue is the combination, the overall. But behind this, there are some interesting things happening. This is for old people, guys like me, OK? <laughs> These rising lines are rising labor force participation rates. Wow. Old people apparently can't afford to retire. <laughs> so when you go to McDonald's and there's this old guy behind the counter, that's because maybe either he can't afford to retire or he just wants something to do. But anyway, this is the single exception, really. You go across white people, black people, young people, middle-aged people, all of their labor force participation rates are falling. But for more mature people, that's a better name, better descriptor, uh, <laughs> more of them are working. Now, if you look at people 16 to 64 who work 27 plus hours, per week in 2015, Virginia Beach looks pretty good. But here's Buchanan County, and some of you know where that is. It's southwest Virginia, that's a cool country. No jobs, they're not working, okay? And this is interesting, and these data aren't quite comparable to the regular labor force participation rates, but uh, this shows a fall in labor force participation rates across the various cities for uh, a five-year space in there. So what are they doing? Well, that's a good question. Why is this happening? Uh, <laughs> this used to be the major explanation <laughs> that people got discouraged. They couldn't find jobs, so they stopped looking. Demography, more old people, and that's happening, except I just showed you that old people's labor force participation rates are going up. Social safety net? Well, is it possible to somehow put together a combination of things to couple together food stamps, unemployment compensation, disability, whatever it might be, and somehow or another make a go of it? Well, perhaps. What about rising disability? 12% of all the eligible people in West Virginia are on disability. It's about 6% in Virginia. Disability then in West Virginia has become sort of a long-term unemployment compensation that doesn't go away. It doesn't end after 99 weeks or something. It just continues. Who, who's paying that? Taxpayers. Taxpayers, yes. Taxpayers. Yeah. It's primarily a federal <laughs> obligation, but some state contribution to the trust this used to be a popular explanation. More individuals going to college, but I'll show you in a moment. College enrollments have been falling nationally and in Virginia. The gig economy? <clears throat> well, yeah, this may be one of the reasons that we're not counting what's going on out there, because we can't see it. The people don't report it. And I think I've got a job because I'm driving Uber and Lyft, but Nobody out there else thinks I have a job. I'm not being counted. And then there's opioid abuse. And we have a chapter in our reports this year about such and this rising line of drug overdoses. But look at that second sentence. More than 40% of prime age men not in the labor force said they took an opioid in the previous 24 hours. Now, that's deadly for you if you want to get a job. If the employer gives you a drug test, and many, many do, you fail. And Bob McNabb and I meet now these employers who tell us, we can't hire people. We're trying to hire truck drivers or whatever it might be, and we can't get the job done. We can't get the job filled because people keep flunking the exam. But it's a little bit scary, too, that 20% who are employed said they did. Now, some of the opioid 
use is entirely legitimate. You've got